popping, everybody? Welcome to Culture Pop Season 1, Episode 13. We're back this week. Aaron's back this week. And we have a pretty fun show for you. Aaron, it's been a little while. How are you, sir? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right, Josh. Yeah, we had some uh, some scheduling conflicts here and there. You were getting stuck at work. We were getting <laughs> stuck doing uh, you know doing projects and, and meetings. And uh, so, yeah, we kind of bounced around a little bit. But it's good to be back. I, I, I agree. I, I'm just going to say that uh, we're busy because we're awesome. That that works. That works. <laughs> I don't know if anybody. I don't know if anybody buys it, but well, but. we're we're gonna tell ourselves that. That's what I tell myself in the mirror every morning before I go to work, and it's just coincidence that I come home and cry. I mean, I you know, <laughs> eating an entire sleeve of cookie dough over the sink. Just <laughs> exactly. You you know me too well. I don't even use a spoon. I just bite it. It's just you know, I just go into it like it's corn. Just go for it. <laughs> From the middle? Oh, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> What's crazy is like I had a, a issue one night when you were available, and then you had a week that you weren't available, and then I wasn't available, and then you weren't available, and it, so it's it's been a, it's nice to have my Alberto Magnifico back. Well, thank you very much. It's good to yeah. be back. It's good to be back. I sh- I'm hopefully gonna have normal schedules moving forward. So awesome. We'll we'll keep things rolling. Speaking of, uh, before we kind of like get into stuff. Speaking of uh, beards. Uh, for anyone that tunes into uh, Comics Aficionados on Saturday, uh, the the one and only the the kind of the kind hearted Doc was in your neck of the woods recently, and you guys met up, correct? Yeah, yeah, I met Doc face to face for the first time. Uh, we went and we hung out. It was kind of funny. Uh, I had structured my day because Doc was like, "Okay, well, I get off at five, you know, and then I'll drive from Southgate to, uh, you know, we we're going to meet in Huntington Beach or you know, a nice place to hang out." Um, so I planned it out to where I was going to like meet with my aunt, have dinner with her and my uncle, and then meet Doc for drinks. Um, but the time got all jumbled up. So I ended up like Doc had dinner with my aunt and I. And then uh, she was like, oh, I'll go to a bar. Just come back to the house. So like we just kicked back by the by the pool. And uh, and then Max came over uh, and we had a really nice, uh, really nice evening. Just nice. uh, talking about talking about comics and, and uh, you know, filling my aunt in on what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> Uh, so did, did Max happen to hit on your aunt? I, I heard he might like cougars. Uh, no, he did not. But, uh, you okay. know, in fairness, my uncle was right there. So, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he, he wouldn't do that. He, he is a gentleman. He is a gentleman. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, before we get into the topics, let's just kind of run through the, the comments real quick and see all who all is here. We've got, uh, Nadia first. Boom. She was in the comments early today. And uh, I have a little poll asking if people smash the like button. And the two options are like it was a blue beetle or I smashed it with my Kennergy. And she said Kennergy all the way. (laughs) I'm hearing that Ken is the unsung hero of that movie. Uh, Apparently, I still haven't I still haven't seen it. I I might see it at some point. It hasn't happened yet. Um, I might wait for. We'll see. We'll see. It looks like the movie theater uh, release might be a little weak the next couple of weeks. So if it's still around, I might I might check it out. Um, we have Miss Sassy Sasquatch in the house. Hey, hey, uh, you guys, she's got a wonderful channel. You should go check her out. She's got a terrific Sunday stream. And I think monthly she has a Truly stream. And if you've never seen Mrs. C on some Trulies, you're missing out. That's all I'm going to say. So just you're missing out. She's, she's incredible and hilarious. Um, let's see who else. Oh, speaking of cannolis and sasquatch we have cannoli sasquatch himself mrs uh c's husband wonderful monday night movie stream i was on uh not this past monday but the monday before and we talked about the batman uh last night they talked about batman and robin and they had abomination aj on there talking about how incredible that movie was batman and robin yeah batman and robin (laughs) okay (laughs) so listen uh ego and Ego and AJ have a Saturday morning show that they do uh, called Heroes No Capes. But Ego, if you're watching this, I need you to have a talk with your boy and uh, kind of knock some sense into him for, for all of us. Or don't, because it's entertaining to watch his takes half the time. We've got Jana in the house. Sup, boners. Sup, Jana. Sorry Jana. Speak. Sup, vagina, I guess. Maybe, possibly. Who mm. knows? But welcome all. No, you gotta, you gotta have, you, you can't use the actual medical term, see, because oh, okay. not, not, not the medical term. So you've gotta, you know, you gotta have, a, hey, lady business, or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I might actually do that because it can come across as not sounding vulgar. So 
Yeah, no, it sounds kind of nice, right? Like lady business, like <laughs> very what respectful. Lady? How's the business? <laughs> We have a few more people that just popped in. Chris Evans. Hello, Chris. How are you, sir? And we have Zach's. Joshy Poo. Zach Poo. And Shoulder. Um, getting into tonight, uh, we might have a, a shorter night tonight. With, with all this strike and stuff, everything's been kind of ho-hum quiet. Aside from all these tiny little sites that are just throwing out random rumors, trying to get quick with the real news, uh, which I'm avoiding that. Stuff. If you've heard about John Krasinski being Batman, ignore it. It's not real. Um, or they had that porn star. Someone created that rumor that that porn star is playing Lex Luthor, which I know is a joke, but everyone started running with it. So is, uh, sound off in the chat if Josh's uh, audio got muggy for you guys, because it got, it got muggy for me. Oh, but, shoot. Uh, oh, no, see, now now you came back. Like, oh, I came back? Yeah, so like I think when you're closer to the mic, it's better. Okay, I'll get, I'll get closer to the mic. <laughs> what's up mike but uh but yeah there was that rumor that uh i like i saw the guy's name was like johnny sins yeah, I mean, something like, like that him like in a suit <laughs> and like before like and it was like he does look like lex luther he so, does like, it was like if they were like this is a, a legitimate actor and, and he's been you know cast as lex luther i think people would be like oh but yeah there was the big rumor that this porn star was uh it was cast as lex luther and and someone asked james gunn directly and he was like there's no. no way you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the uh, I was the idiot that was like, dude, I don't even know who this person is, and his is his last name really sins, and then it's like Google, and I'm like, yep, you know what? Nope, nope, nope. Shouldn't have Google that. Put on safe search, right? Uh, you know, well, no, no. I mean, <laughs> thankfully, right. I was thankfully it's on yeah, my it's phone nice. and not at work. Uh huh. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you shouldn't search that from uh, from your work computer. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I saw his name. I was like, I have no idea who this guy is. And then I just saw the picture of him in the suit, and I was like, I just look like Lex Luthor, though. Yeah, I just assumed it was some like no name actor that I didn't know. And I mean, mm -hmm. I guess I guess technically he is. Technically, that's true. Yeah, he was a uh, just actor. not in the films that I uh, partake in <laughs> watching. Um, all right. So one of the first things we're going to talk about tonight is Blue Beetle. Uh, it, it was it was the big release this weekend. It came out. Uh, it was going to be a huge hit. This is the the start of the the quote unquote start of the new DCU. Not the film, just the character. Uh, did you go see it, Aaron? Uh, I did not. It's <laughs> uh, it's such a weird caveat to do that. Like this is the first character in the new DC universe. Oh, oh. so the movie counts? No, no yeah, the movie doesn't yeah. count. Just the character. Maybe not this... even the actor. I don't know. You know, like who knows what. Uh, you know, um, but uh, I do have some friends who saw it. Uh, they uh, they said some very, uh, very tepid but complimentary things about it. Like, mostly everybody seems to agree that if this came out in 2019, it would be an enjoyable popcorn flick that people would have flocked to. I Maybe. I, I would have said, like, early 2000s, early to mid-2000s, sure. That far I, back, I, you think? Yeah, because it's, I, I, you know, I, I thought it was fine. It was fine across the board. It was so fine that I didn't care about anything that happened in the movie. But that being said, I didn't hate anything about the movie. I was just like, all right, things are happening. And uh, when I was discussing it with some friends and, and they were kind of asking just kind of how it unfolded and, you know, action and plot. I just said it, it to me, it felt very paint by numbers. Like we have to have this happen. We have to have this happen. Now this is going to happen. Now, you know, this character is going to going to die and this character is going to feel inspired and these characters are going to rise up in this way like it was all just so like mapped out but obviously mapped out and uh that i like i i knew the beats were coming before they happened so i was like okay okay um and then there wasn't ever like an action scene or a moment that really made me go like oh that was a good moment um there is an emotional moment that is done partially well uh but that was the only time i actually felt something in this movie rest the rest of the time i was like okay sure yeah right on all right um, <laughs> i like i like that your your review of the film was essentially things happened <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there was motion on the screen and and things were done <laughs> it's uh it had, it, it had all of the elements of a motion picture there it's were the characters there were sets it's like the stoner review uh hey josh you think about the movie <laughs> Man, I like watch this movie and like there are people <laughs> and <laughs> things happen. <laughs> um, no, I guess to go a little more specific, it, 
right away, one of the things that bothered me right away is like within like the first five minutes, there's just this exposition scene of everyone eating dinner where you find out like, oh, this family is just so down on their luck. This is everything that's happened that Jaime didn't know about because he's been in college. Um, and it was literally like, dad had a heart attack. His health is on the decline. Uh, we're losing the home. Oh, we lost the family business. And it's just one right after the other. Um, but it literally so it's a comes... whole lot of it's a whole lot of Peter Parker just right out of the right out of the ye, gate. Ye, whole lot of Peter Parker right out of the gate, and it's literally just like two seconds from each other. This reaction, this reaction, this reaction. I'm like, okay, we get it, we get it, we get where you're going. Um, and I, I, other than that, like there were family dining. I let me let me put it this way: the family is fine, but they're all so over the top caricatures of what they should be. Um, like the sister is kind of the bitchy blunt sister. So she's on a 10. Uh, then you have the surprising granny that is, I'm calling her Grambo because she's like granny Rambo. Because of course I knew the moment I saw her in the pictures, oh. I was like, they're going to have the grandma be like this surprise, like badass, like, cause it's funny when old people do things. Y yes. And you know, if it had been like a single moment, sure. But there's like nine moments and it just becomes a whole like running plot throughout the third act of like grandma knows what she's doing. Um, At so, any yeah. point does she come out with like a rocket launcher filled with chunkless? And just uh, start firing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that is a missed opportunity. Even though people are already saying like, oh, it's kind of racist because it's so stereotypical. I didn't think this movie was racist, but it definitely leaned into the stereotypes of a Hispanic family. Well, I heard they and, try to insert racism really, really ham-fistedly. Like, uh, I hear he shows up for a job, and he's in a nice suit, and his hair is combed, and he looks really good. And the receptionist takes one look at him and is like, oh, deliveries are downstairs or whatever. And, correct. Uh, and they try, to, they try to do, like, that sort of thing. As if, first of all, that there's no way that that guy, I've seen the scene of him in the suit with his hair combed. He looks professional. He's going in for a job interview. In a city, there would be all kinds of people you know, that oh, yeah. have different ethnic makeups coming in for interviews. He looks pro, you know, that that's that's one of those things where it's like the demand for prejudice and for racism in, in media seems to outstrip the supply. And they just like kind of force it in in these really like basic ways that uh, I, I think are just, you know, you just roll your eyes when you see them. Oh, absolutely. But but that type of scene that you're you're describing, like that forced moment to me, there were so many forced moments in this. And again, they weren't bad. They were just forced. Like you could just tell like, okay, we, I, there were multiple moments within the movie where I was like, okay, we get it. Let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes we would, sometimes we wouldn't, but uh, the family kind of got on my nerves because they were too involved and I'm all for family being involved. Um, but they were so involved that it was almost like they, it was almost like that the family themselves were the, the, point of the movie not Jaime or Blue Beetle and there are some fine moments with Jaime when he gets the scarab and it comes onto him and he transforms into the suit that scene looked terrific like it it looked gross and creepy and weird in the way it was almost like it was just like burning uh, like rubber was almost like just getting onto his skin and me like meshing with the skin. That whole transformation I thought was top notch, great filming, uh, great effects. That was the best thing with Blue Beetle, his creation. See, now, Everything I, after I, I that. Friend, I had a friend tell me that he actually like was really bothered by that scene because he said you had this great kind of like body horror moment, and then yeah. it was totally juxtaposed against George Lopez screaming like an idiot. And like a bunch of slapstick like stuff going on around it, and it was like it, he he was like, I, it should have been a horrific moment that was like you know that made you feel something. He goes, but I got really irritated because all the stuff around it didn't match, like it, 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 and so it threw him off. And I will agree with that. It was definitely like a body horror moment. I it didn't bother me with the tone as much because it was very clear they wanted this to be more of a family friendly movie. Um, but I, I will say something that this movie suffered from was not having a clear identity. It didn't know what it wanted to be. And it was shifting between tones uh, pretty consistently. So like you have this body horror moment. Uh, there's plenty of jokes that are kind of like low level jokes, not like gutter, but just like ki even kids would laugh at. Uh, but then there's mm -hmm. also like sexual innuendo jokes that aren't really innuendos. It's just, oh, here's a sexual joke as if this were like a teen movie. 
Uh, and then you have it trying to be a serious superhero movie with some some weight to it. And then also just like old school. And this is why I said the early 2000s, but like kind of in the vein of like the Fantastic Four films where it's like, here is like hokey hero. And here's your, you know, mustache twirling villain that's so villainous. She's acting like a terrible person in front of everyone, but it's fine because she's a villain and no one cares. Um, mm -hmm. so it, it, you're, it's trying to balance all those tones. Uh, and it, it just, for me, it never fully felt like a true identity. I think that's, uh, I think that's probably fair. Yeah. That, that kind of jives with what I've been hearing from everybody is, you know, everybody kind of says it's fine. It's not horrible. Uh, there's some stuff that you'll enjoy. There's some stuff that you'll cringe at. Um, it's just kind of a bit like this right over the plate kind of superhero, like you said, paint by numbers. Uh, right. and, um, you know, but but ultimately they said like you know it was fine, it was enjoyable on some level, but it's ultimately immediately forgettable. It's immediately forgettable, and I do think this movie suffers too from not having Ted Cord around to kind of set things up. It seems like a way, and you know, we're seeing this a lot with superhero movies now. We're trying to just jump to a certain point without setup. DC in particular has suffered with this. Uh, Ted Cord's presence is there; he's referenced, he's mentioned a lot, but he disappeared. But not having seen him or his history, it just felt like a, a lifeless insert for the sake of inserting it. Uh, and there is a mm -hmm. tease at the end of the film. But um, yeah, I don't know. And, and even if we look at, because to kind of get back on just Jaime's Blue Beetle, one of the things that I was thinking I was going to look forward or enjoy was the action. And it was fine. I, there was nothing that blew, my, blew me away. This sword scene was, was kind of cool. Uh, but we saw it in the trailers and then uh, they have a, a scene in the trailer where he's in like tunnels and he kicks a guy. He does like a two kick combo to a guy and knocks him into a wall. And I was like, cool. If we're getting stuff like that, I'm, I'm on board, but that was about the intensity of it. Do they <laughs> like, establish? We, it was the Jaime cool moments. As, do they establish Jaime as like an anime or video game fan? Cause it looks like he grows a buster sword. Like, you know, like, is there any kind of like his identity in the way that he uses the blue beetle costume? Not really. Cause no? this is pretty much, this is only one of the, a lot of the stuff that uh, weapons that he's created or creates, it, it's the scarab itself creating it. And then it's him trying to pull it back. Cause they're lethal weapons. This is one of the only weapons he full on creates. Uh, and then at the end, he creates a sword at one point, but it's not a sword like this. It's just your standard sword. Uh, so there wasn't anything super creative with the in my opinion with the weapons with him coming to the board there may have been a reference to him liking anime or video games but i, I genuinely don't remember it um but yeah i and, and this is one of the things that i did want to talk to you about because i feel like with jaime and when you have a movie like this there's so much potential with what you can do with this blue beetle suit with the scarab and i just felt like it was wasted and as someone you who who's familiar with blue beetle who's written a show that has blue beetle on it specifically this one you know I kind of wanted to get your take on like, if you could do a film, what would you want to bring into this element to, to kind of really like help show like, Hey, this is why this character is cool. Well, I mean, you have to, you have to give him some personality. Like he has to have, you know, in, in the, in the course of his journey, you have to see him figuring things out. And then, you know, the, uh, the thing with the scarab is that there's that back and forth pull. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, anytime you have, you know, like the, the venom symbiote, you know, or, or, uh, you know, any kind of like, AI that you're dealing with, there's going to be that that push and pull. And so you have to have him kind of like struggle against the suit. You know, obviously the suit wants to do things a certain way. He wants to do things a certain way. And then, you know, eventually they have to kind of like come together. But it should be like his kind of imagination and the things that he, you know, and not in the typical stereotypical way that, uh, you know, DC has been doing things lately where it'd be like, oh, he's going to use the the suit his way. So he's going to be, what if he grows a big taco weapon? You know, like that's the way that DC has been doing things lately. Um, you know, but yeah, just like I said, like I saw the Buster Sword and I immediately thought like, okay, well, you know, I would have put in some Final Fantasy references or some things about like, you know, he likes anime. He likes it. You know, you have a scene where he's like actually watching it and there's a guy with a big Buster Sword so that when he does that, it kind of, you know, you go, oh, okay, I see where, you know, where he's getting that. He's drawing it from his own personality, his own imagination. Yeah, I, I think you're uh, thinking much more and much more deeper into this than any of the writers actually did. I, I think they just, everything is surface level here. Um and, and you mentioned something that kind of reminded me too is is this film, even as far as the character and exploring the character, it felt like such a Xerox copy of so many things. It felt like a Xerox copy of Spider-Man. It felt like a Xerox copy of Iron Man. 
it felt like a Xerox copy of Green Lantern. And all these things are just kind of coming into play. And it's almost like they wanted to recreate moments or scenes that have come from either those films or those comics. But it's such a half-assed version with no actual setup to it that when you do get moments, even though they could have been cool and should have been cool, they were just okay. So That's disappointing because I think that, you know, Blue Beetle, uh, although I am a larger fan of the Ted Kord version, just because I, I, you know, read his adventures longer. And of course, you know, we've gotten some great stories with him with Booster Gold. I do like Jaime. Uh, I do like what they've done with him. I like what they, uh, what Greg and Brandon did with him on Young Justice and the way that they worked him in. And I think he's got a great look like that. That costume yep. is really cool looking. Agreed. And the fact that they recreated it so faithfully really made me kind of root for this movie. Uh, and then I didn't end up go see, going and seeing it because the director oh. running his mouth made me <laughs> not root for the movie and just not care. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, man, I, I really would have loved to have loved this. But now even all the review, you know, and I may still have gone and seen it at some point, but with all the reviews coming in and saying like, you know, yeah, it's fine. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with waiting for it on, on HBO Max. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry. Just, just, just Max now. Oh, just, it's just, come on, Aaron. It's just Max now. Um, you put it yeah. on, it's just it's just MVP videos. Is this all just a guy dancing in his silkies? What's going on? What is happening? <laughs> um, I mean, even when I went to go see this, I, I you know we're in we're in the text group, people watching. Uh, I've got a text group with Aaron, Drew, Drew's brother Kyle, and, and Max, and uh, we pretty much talk daily. But when I went to go see this, I text the group that I was going to see it, and you guys were like, "Oh, are you a glutton for punishment?" And then Max was like, "Why do you hate yourself?" And I'm like, "Look, look, look." I've got AMC stubs, okay? Like, I might as well <laughs> use it. Like, I'm already paying for... I'm paying that money whether I see a movie or not. Uh, but if <laughs> if I were buying tickets, I don't know if I would have gone to see this, especially after seeing a lot of the just kind of the, the mediocre or lukewarm reviews. Uh, even the cinema score for this was, I think, a B plus B. I think B plus B, somewhere around in there, yeah. which is, you know, not promising. Um, but yeah, it, it, for me, it was a total letdown. And I think some... Oh, Lord, folks, here we go. Here we go. Did somebody say so? <laughs> Ironically, I was not the one that brought them up this time. So <laughs> that's what, what Max is, right? That you turn on that app and it's just oh, MVP all the time. <laughs> MVP all the time. You want Silky's ladies? We've got it. Although I okay, embarrassing moment here. So I'm on Instagram the other day, and uh in like when you go to search, it's got your like whatever recommendations or whatever. And one of them was like uh, uh, studs and silkies. And I just started laughing and I wanted to screenshot it and send it to Max so bad, but I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. You know, I think Blue, ba Blue Beetle, unfortunately, is um, is kind of suffering the sins at the box office of all of DC's regime changes and just their inability to decide on any, you know, direction. Um, when they cut Zack Snyder out, and brought yep. in Joss Whedon. That was that was kind of the beginning of the end because, you know, yeah, those movies that Zack Snyder was doing weren't billion dollar movies right out of the gate, but that was an unrealistic expectation. Marvel yep. had, to, you know, it's not like Marvel started and the first Iron Man was a billion dollar movie. You know, it's like it was a build, and they, you know, they built slowly. Yep. But DC leadership at the time just wanted to jump right in. We'll mm -hmm. just put, we'll just plop heroes down in the middle of their careers with no build up. You know, and, and people thought that this was, you know, I think that they really tried to market this um, with, uh, you know, very kind of like device, divisive marketing. Like I saw some articles out there that I'm pretty sure were, you know, commissioned by the studio that said things like, oh, I don't know, if you don't go see Blue Beetle, there might not be as much Mexican representation in, uh, you know, in film anymore. You know, trying to do that thing and, and do the emotional blackmail. And I don't think, I think we're past that point largely. Yeah. I don't think that, uh, you know, Black Panther was a phenomenon. But Black Panther also was introduced in Civil War, a movie that mm -hmm. was already very popular and was part of a tapestry that was being woven, building up to, to Endgame. Agreed. You know, the only reason that Captain Marvel did as well as it did is because people thought they had to see it before they oh, saw Endgame. Yeah. I mean, with Captain Marvel, they even teased. like they, they Well, I don't want to say they teased, but they highly implied that you needed you needed to see it before you saw Endgame. Um, and, and you didn't. You didn't at all. Um, and even with Black Panther, I would say that while I think Black Panther has its problems, I think it is worlds better of a film overall than than Blue Beetle. Uh, I think the writing 
uh, is better. I think the plots are better. I think the characters are better. Uh, I think the biggest thing that, that hurts uh, Black Panther is just that that final act and that, you know, that I, Marvel suffers from from the, its third acts more more often than not. Yeah, if I have um, a guy who has your same powers in a big CG. Oh player, gosh, yeah, you know, you know and I look, I'm I'm an MCU defender, but man, um, I do want to go to kind of comments real quick and uh, kind of see what people are, are saying about Blue Beetle. Uh, so we got Ivan Sand, dude. What's up, Ivan? How are you? Uh, he put they should have focused more on Ted Cord, Dan Garrett, and how the Scarab was controlling him, and they need to stop making the villain so generic. One hundred percent agreed. I said this a little bit earlier that uh, I felt the absence of Ted Cord, and I guess general audiences may not have felt this way if they don't know the character. But I, I just feel like there's so much uh, backstory that's missing involving the idea of the Blue Beetle, and they. But do if you min- build that up, if you build that up, or you or you spend time with the villain, you don't have time for the wacky family hijinks. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> You need to, you need, it's, and it's a two hour movie. So like you need to decide what your, you know, what your real estate is going to be spent on. Agreed. And, Agreed. You, know, you should be building up a villain to, to be interesting. Like I think the first Shazam movie actually did a decent job of that. They spent almost as much time with, uh, with uh, Dr. Savannah as they did with the kids. Billy. Um, yeah. And with, with I, Billy. Yeah. I will actually go so far as to say that as far as the DCU films go, Shazam is probably my favorite. I felt like it did a lot of things right, uh, and it was darker than what I was expecting from it because I thought this was going to be the, like the kid family friendly movie, and it was in a lot of ways. But they weren't afraid to go to some darker themes uh, when they needed to. So yeah, they had, they had uh, some well, they had some demons tear apart a boardroom of uh, you know like just shred some humans in a boardroom. That was well, that I was mean, dark. yeah, I mean, like you have that darkness, but you also had the heaviness of of you know when Billy finds his his birth mom. And she just outright rejects him. I re- I'm getting chill bumps. I remember watching that scene, and it, it for me, like it, 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 I felt that scene, and I was like, sh- I can't believe they're putting this in what's a, you know, a kids movie. But I'm so glad they did because it had so much weight to it. Uh, but they I do le- mention. I left you. I left you at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> I just took like, you to the fair. I just left you there. Like you like so fairs. Sad. Fairs are fun. It's fine. You're fine. I thought you'd be uh, adopted by the circus folk and just. <laughs> Because just go the travel the world, see the sights. <laughs> Why are you so ungrateful? Um, I, I was gonna say they do they do reference Dan Garrett here, um, but that's that's all it is. It, it's like they teased a lot of stuff as if it would be uh, a plot point later or in other movies, uh, but I definitely don't think that's gonna happen now with the box office, which we'll get to in a second. Stop teasing things that fans will like going like hey if the first movie does well we'll get to the stuff you really want to see give us the thing that we really want to see and maybe you'll get a second movie yeah well and and part of that tease too is like you're you're taking away you know i think you refer to it as real estate we'll say time real estate uh of you know good storytelling for the sake of like uh uh hey oh i'm nudging you right now um but yeah uh chris said he could have done without the family entirely i mean i understand why they're there and I think if they had taken that plot point a little more seriously, like there's other than one scene, there's really not a lot of seriousness with a family. And if you would have added that humanity of like, hey, we, we are serious. We are here. We do love each other. Even if you didn't go too heavy, it would have made a world of difference other than that one scene. I'm not going to say which scene, but there's one scene. But it's kind of like everything else is just slapstick. And and while I'm saying this, I do want to clarify, George Lopez, for me, by far the best part of this movie. Really? I hate George <laughs> Lopez, so I don't know that I I don't know that I would agree with you there uh, if I'd seen it. But, um, you know, I Christopher, mean, the, Christopher, the thing that you need to realize is that this movie, it's about family. And that's what makes it so powerful. Just like The Last Jedi. Just like Carrie Fisher said about The Last Jedi. <laughs> and this is the last Jedi of superhero films. <laughs> you, you know, when I, when I was talking about Xerox copies, I forgot to mention the uh, the Fast franchise, Fast and Furious franchise. We should we should throw that in there. Yeah, it's about um, family. Family. I've said, just, hey, said, hey, Arnold does it better when it comes to badass old people. Dude, I haven't watched Hey Arnold in so long. Did you ever watch? It was a, it was a cartoon on Nickelodeon. Did you ever? Oh, I thought he was saying, hey, comma. Arnold, as in Schwarzenegger, does it better when it comes to badass old people. Oh, like, maybe he know. is. <laughs> no, I don't know that he. I don't know that he is. He might be talking about the cartoon. Hey, Arnold. I'm, oh, I'm, okay, I'm Ivan. Which one. 
<laughs> you need to clarify. Are you talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger or are you talking about the cartoon Hey Arnold? And I feel like you're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger and I'm about to look like a total dumbass. <laughs> no, I think you're probably right because he I don't know. He didn't put a comment in there. And uh, and also, when's the last time Arnold was was badass in uh, <laughs> in a movie? Well, didn't he just have like a, a little like mini resurgence on Netflix? I think he had like his documentary and he had a, a TV show come out. I think it was like a comedy action show or something. I didn't hear anybody talking about it, so oh. I think it's just another one of those it, things that went to Netflix and there it was, and that was it. it. Did okay on Netflix. I don't know if it's hit Nielsen ratings yet. I'll, I'd have to look, but I think it was called Fubar. So, uh, yeah. Zach's put, uh, were you blown away like Grace Randolph that a Puerto Rican director was capable of making professional? <laughs> um, but was it professional looking? Mm, it, it looked okay. There were times that it looked really good and times where it, it looked, it looked like it was a lower budget film. So I actually, I actually worked with Grace Randolph at one point. So I, yes. I have a lot of, I have a lot of insight on, on Grace Randolph and, and her <laughs> takes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, sometimes she says things that you're just like, what <laughs> what was that what we're gonna do guys is we're gonna you know all meet up at a convention and we're gonna get aaron really drunk and then get grace randolph stories oh yeah yeah sure <laughs> uh we have flash phoenix not enough mrs doubtfire it does okay. look like mrs doubtfire i said that when i saw the trailer i was like the abuela looks like mrs doubtfire what's going on Okay, so seeing on my on my streaming thing, it keeps like trying to push Mrs. Doubtfire towards me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, hey, watch Mrs. Doubtfire. And it's got that image of, of Robin Williams with all the goop on his face, you know, when he was trying to hide the uh, because he didn't have all the makeup on. Right. Um, and I was like, oh, like I, every time I saw it, I thought it was an ad for Blue Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> so funny story with Don here. Uh so Don and Gator did a review of Blue Beetle. Um and they hadn't even seen the movie. They just made shit up. But they have this whole bit talking about how it pulled so much from Mrs. Doubtfire. And they're just they're just like running with it. Like, mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't seen or watched or listened, sorry, Don, if you didn't want me to say that. You, I mean, clearly, if you've seen the movie, you're going to know. But uh, you sh just regardless, you should, should go watch Don and Gator's review. It's on Flaccid. Or no, it's on the Fanarchy channel, I think. But uh, go check it out. It's hilarious. I'm not going to lie. I kind of bought in. I listened to it before going to see the movie, and I bought into some of the stuff actually being real because, again, yours truly can be an idiot, and it's incredibly gullible. I uh, love so, I love that. I love the whole concept of reviewing a movie you haven't seen. And just, oh, like, my God. It was like, great. Or even, like, predicting things that you might be in there and then seeing if you're right. Because I, mean, I know you're going to get people in the chat going, that's not what happened. You didn't see the movie. Like, they won't get the joke. You know, yeah, be, like, not at all. But I was legitimately waiting for certain things to happen. I'm like, I can totally see this going down. Like at this point, I'm on board. Like I want to see when this happens. Um, yeah. But they, one of the jokes that I thought was the funniest is they talk about when Mrs. Doubtfire is uh, figuring out what Mrs. Doubtfire is going to look like. So she's going through all the the changes with the different wigs and face prosthetics and stuff. So they made a joke that the the grandma has, does that at one point, and I was like. <laughs> Okay, this either has to be before they're trying to like go into hiding because a new SWAT came to the house, or it's gonna be at the end and somehow he gets like a job and he's like rich and then he's like, Grandma, go take care of yourself, go get pampered. It, it doesn't happen. But I like when SWAT came to the house and uh, and took Elian Gonzalez out of the home. Oh yeah. Ugh. I know Max doesn't get that because he was like six when that happened. But... <laughs> Max is like, who? <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Um, I, lo I love you, Max. Don't, uh, don't don't let me read you too much. I I oh so I don't I don't remember when you said this, but apparently you said they force him in. Majestic beard, Aaron. <laughs> oh, you you've uh you've gotten a uh, upgrade on the name. I know, I know. It's oh man, I got to change from global phenomenon. Uh, you know that's really over now anyway. That since uh, since uh, Little Mermaid flopped at the box office, that was that was my whole point. And putting global phenomenon Aaron Sparrow because it's like, oh, apparently we can just call anything a global phenomenon now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Chris, Fast and Furious is also about family. Is family. It? <laughs> yeah. It's very subtle, I think. <laughs> uh, possibly. Uh, look, Chris, you're, you're you just realized you're a few seconds behind, but you know what? I'm like uh, way behind on comments, so you're you're good, brother. No worries. Uh, Flas has said George Lopez. George Lopez show is underrated. I don't think I ever watched the George Lopez show. I think the George Lopez uh, show is, uh, I think it perpetuates the negative stereotype that George Lopez is funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. 
Uh, we got some some Grace comments here. Uh, Flaccid, you know Grace, Aaron. I need to talk to you. Laugh out loud. Yeah, I, well, I worked with. I, I wouldn't. Um, I, I wouldn't say that. Like we, you know, for my part, I thought we were we were fairly friendly. Um, you know, back when I worked at Boom, uh, you know, I kept trying to get her on different projects and things like that because uh, the Muppets project she was on uh, kind of fell apart in, in various ways, and, and it wasn't really the kind of like what she wanted to do. So I wanted to, you know, like get other pitches from her and things like that. So I, I'd work, I'd worked with her, but I, you know, I spent a little bit of time with her at conventions and things like that. So I think I got a, a pretty decent beat on her personality. Yeah, I, I think Flaccid just wants to know how she has uh, nine hundred and something thousand subscribers. Listen, yeah. she was in. She was in right at the beginning of YouTube. She was, uh, you know. So, um, you know, the, I, I think that I'm actually surprised to hear that she doesn't have over a million for as long as she's been on. That's fair. I would have thought she could have accumulated that by now. Uh, but, um, but she was in there right at the beginning, even while I was working with her at Boom, and this is like 2009, 2010. Uh, right. She was already doing, you know, movie math and and uh, you know doing her show. So she's been on YouTube, you know, for a long time. Definitely. Uh, and Zach said that uh, you're Grace Tease. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I will say something that uh, should I say this? Um, one of the editors that I worked with, uh, who I, I'm not particularly a, a pers personally a huge fan of for various reasons that are probably out there in the press, but uh, one of the uh, one of the editors at Boom once asked me, "Do you find that Grace has uh, oh how should we put this a lesbian accent?" And I was like, "What does that mean?" <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? <laughs> and to this day, I'm still like, I'm still like, what, what exactly? I mean, are you just trying to say, are you just trying to ask me if Grace is a lesbian? Is that what you're trying to ask me? Because I, I don't believe so, but does it matter? Like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. If you ask me what does a lesbian sound like, I'd be like, um, I, I don't know what they sound like. I just have to expect them to say like, uh, hey, we're going to load up the U-Haul and take the dogs to the beach and have a picnic. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we do have Javain in the house. I want to say what's up, Javain. Uh, Javain. he said, yeah. Uh, so Javain's also, uh, typically, or can sometimes be on, uh, comics official. I can't talk tonight worth a crap. Sometimes he is on comics official autos with Wes on Saturdays. Uh, but he put my girls love George Lopez. They normally hate DCU movies, but they really enjoyed this one. The cord SWAT team siege and how it ends is the best part of the film. Agreed. I commented that that was the, the one part of the movie that I actually felt something. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think if you're one of those people that's been asking for something that's just kind of lighthearted and fun uh, without being Thor or Ant-Man levels of stupid, then you're going to enjoy this. Because um, I think if you say lighthearted and fun, people are automatically going to be like, oh, Thor was terrible, though. Or no, we got enough with Ant-Man or She-Hulk. This isn't that. Oh, well, it's like is, when you hear when you hear oh the Marvels is going to be different for, from you know other MCU oh. because it's really wacky and silly and I'm like yeah yeah that's what we've been asking for after Thor Love and Thunder and yeah. uh, Ant Man Quantum Mania we we want wacky and silly yeah and, and uh, yeah yeah not yeah oh I'm terrified to watch that movie um, I I will say I have friends that that uh, saw this and liked it um, my friend Jay from Comics Pause. Uh, he watched it. He really enjoyed it. Uh, my friend Andy from Holy Batcast, he watched it. He enjoyed it. Uh, I, I do think you can have fun. Um, I, I think part of my problem was I went in expecting more. And it's like, once again, I felt like this just failed in comparison to what we get from so many of the animated DC products. And and for me, it's like, I don't understand how you can't translate you you do it so well in other mediums or you know these especially these animated shows and you just can't seem to grasp that same synergy and and uh themes uh to, well, grace, to bring grace to the... randolph would probably say uh, just judging by what i'm hearing that uh you know uh, hey you're probably taking a chance right out of the gate with a puerto rican direct uh director I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> puerto you know, ricans me, can't do stuff there's a michael ian black where uh Bit on Reno 911, where he, I think he's like a he's like a, supposed to be a kid with cancer, but you know they got him in the back of the car and he's asking them to do things and he's like, can I can I can I play with your gun? I, I'm dying. You know he keeps doing like stuff like that to like pull on their heartstrings. But at one point he says something about he said he was a lawyer, a Puerto Rican lawyer. Can you imagine anything more ridiculous? And I thought that, that was like a really funny joke because of how ridiculous it is. But now apparently yeah. uh, you guys are saying that. You know, Grace Randolph's doing the same thing. Like a Puerto Rican director. Who would have thought he could make a good movie? 
You know, I, I will tell you my my only connection with Puerto Rico, other than having a friend, you know, a couple of friends from Puerto Rico, is uh, when I was working my corporate job, the retailer that I worked for, we opened up stores in Puerto Rico. And uh, when we were, were building and opening, uh, pretty much their, their version of the cartel was real quick to say like, hey, you're going to pay us monthly uh, and we'll protect your store. And we were very much like, yeah, no, we're good. We don't need that. We're fine. Well, then they started slashing our windows and saying, hey, you're going to pay us monthly and we're going to protect your store. And I think we we did uh, we replaced the windows like three or four times before we finally were like, you know, what, we're going to pay you guys monthly. So you'll stop slashing our windows and you can protect our store. So that's my Puerto Rico story. There you go. <laughs> All don't know how Rican, we. All of my Puerto Rico stories are about women and probably shouldn't be, <laughs> should, shouldn't be aired publicly. That's that's for the that's for the other stream. We'll we'll save it for later. Uh, we for do Josh have after dark. Josh after dark. We do have Copa in the house. Hello, hello, Copa. He said, "Yo, flaccid." Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Ivan Sanchez said they had the comics and story was interesting. Uh, that I'm baffled they didn't use use it as a storyboard unless they didn't want to pay. Uh, you know, look, they don't I, have it, to pay. They don't have to pay. The yeah. They don't have to pay. It's almost like it's come to either. I, I think it's kind of twofold. I think one, it's uh, a lot of arrogant people in Hollywood that think they are better than what the comics can do or have done. And yeah, I mean, if you compare it to a lot of comics coming out today, sure. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the case for all comics. And I think we've seen that there are plenty of comics that did this way better, but I also think it's, they've got this idea that they have to subvert expectations and they have to change it because they, they can't possibly tell a story that you already know about. Meanwhile, especially most of us comic fans, we want to see the story that we know. Like for us, it's like, I cannot wait to see what I love on the big screen so you're not really doing any any wins here. Like the general audiences that aren't familiar with comics aren't going to know what's going to happen anyways. And the people that do read comics and love these comics, you're taking away what they want. You kind of referenced this earlier, Aaron. Like we have what we want. We know what we want. And you're like, yeah, no, no, no. But you're going to know what's coming. So guess what? We got to change this stuff. And we're going to do this instead. Also, well, and then you change better. it for a, for a totally paint by number story that like yeah. any you know, you could swap Blue Beetle out and put in any generic, you know, teen superhero. You could have just made up a superhero and it would have been, it would have essentially been the same film. There's nothing in here that's inherently like super tied to the, to the Blue Beetle. It's like generic superhero script and we just plop Blue Beetle down into it and then made a few adjustments. Uh, so, you know, skipping the source material is really, you know, it's, it's really, it is arrogant. It's, uh, yeah. you know, the example I always use is G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra. Mm -hmm. if, we, yep. if you remember that terrible film. Yep. I, uh, sadly, yes. I remember seeing a behind the scenes and the the costume designer was like, yeah, I just couldn't wait to redesign these iconic characters. And it was like, yeah, well, they all look stupid. Like your yeah. commander looked stupid. Your Cobra Troopers looked stupid. Like, you know, you redesigned them all right. And, and you even said it to redesign these iconic characters. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to redesign something that's iconic? That's what the in people's part of people's investment in the property is the recognizability. So yep. I don't understand when they go, oh, oh, don't look at the source material. We're going to do our own thing with this. Don't do this. Don't do that. But you're grabbing onto an IP that you're thinking has an existing fan base and therefore is better than creating something out of whole cloth. But then you try to create something out of whole cloth using something that has an existing fan base and it doesn't work because we see it and we go, oh, that's not that's not what the thing that I would like. That's, that's a, you know, a watered down version of it. I don't care. Yep. Uh, 100%. Uh, Gervain says Blue Beetle definitely had a Meteor Man vibe to it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Oh, what if, whatever happened to him? Whatever I, happened to, uh, to that comedian? I have no idea, but that's great. Like, I want to go look that stuff up now. I liked I liked that guy back in the day. Uh, Vex said Blue Beetle. But B L E W. <laughs> uh, Vex also has a channel, guys. You should check it out. Uh, she did a review for Blue Beetle. I have not watched it yet. Um, so I need to go watch your review, but uh, I Vex tends to do some really good reviews. Copa also does really good reviews. And then uh, Zax and Flaccid usually have really fun commentaries on stuff. So if you're ever looking for something to do and you feel like TV or movies have let you down, just scour YouTube, guys. We've got a lot of good stuff here. 
uh, IJP Mexican has showed up and he put, oh my God, my people. <laughs> do you mean Josh and I or do you mean <laughs> Well, I mean, IJP Mexican looks more white than Mexican. So uh, maybe he does mean you and I. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, Vex says, how's everyone doing tonight? Pretty good, Vex. How are you? Um, and then she also put, oh, thanks, Josh. You're welcome, Vex. You're welcome. Uh, I do want to kind of touch on real quick, kind of keeping in line with Blue Beetle and look at the weekend box office. So this was going to be the, the this was supposed to be the big blockbuster hit of the weekend. Um, I honestly, I did not think it was going to unseat Barbie. I'm surprised it did. Uh, but even that, uh, when you're only Barely. pulling in, yeah, when you're only pulling in 25 million, oof. Uh, not a great start. This is the second lowest performing DCU opening weekend. The only thing that it beat was Wonder Woman 1984. And, and, Wonder and Woman, that came out during the pandemic. I, yeah, that one came out, I believe, in 2020 during the pandemic. I don't even think theaters were open or they're no, just opened or... Or I they can't. Were, they were scattered. Yeah, like it was, yeah. I think it's not, some, a, it's not a fair comparison. Yeah, some states had their theaters open. Some states didn't. Uh, but the Suicide Squad, which also kind of opened during roughly that same time, performed better opening weekend than this. So James Gunn's the and Suicide was out Squad. Day and date. Yeah, it was out. Day and and date. was yep. As was Wonder Woman. Uh, so the fact that this did this poorly is is sad, and I do think it kind of falls back to. Um, you know what what you were discussing Aaron with uh I I do think this is a product of um everything that's going on with DC and the tonal shifts and the you know change in and creative leadership uh the fact that these movies for the most part don't matter uh that we're having a relaunch um it, it you know it's it's I think it's falling victim to all of that do I think it deserved more than 25 million for opening weekend maybe but I do think it's pretty under par that you know, if, if I were to score Blue Beetle, I'd probably give it like a 5.5. I didn't hate it. I just thought it was average. And if, if five is like by far the average, there was enough to make me be like, yeah, okay. I, it, it just ticks a notch over to the more positive side. But do I plan on rewatching it? Absolutely not. I'm shocked that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is doing as poorly as it is. That's the one that really blows my mind because although it didn't look appealing to me, I, I like the animation style, but just the, mm -hmm. you know, when the moment that you splash up on the screen, you know, from, you know, perpetual teenager Seth Rogen, I was like, I'm out, you know, like, that was like you know, pretty much, uh, <laughs> I'm done. The kiss of death for me. Cause uh, you might as well put up from the guy that brought you Santa Inc. and Sausage Party. And, you know, like, and it's like, oh, yeah. and now he's doing a kid's film. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. I just like from the moment, I, I just, it didn't appeal to me, but I'm shocked that like more, parents didn't take their kids to it i i think that uh, you know people are just like they're starting to be pretty good at detecting yes you know, whether or not they think something is going to be appropriate for their kids and are paying more attention and i will say i thought a hey, so when uh well, last week we didn't have the show but the week before it was joe and i and, and we both saw teenage mutant Ninja turtles we talked about it and uh, we talked about how one of the things we really liked was I guess the characterization of the turtles, we really enjoyed how uh, they felt like teenagers, but they were still on point as characters. Uh, there was a lot of really just fun moments with them. There was some really funny dialogue that felt naturally funny. It didn't feel like shoehorned in funny. Mm -hmm. um, and everything was felt kind of seamless for the most part. We both hated splinter, um, but then it just kind of loses its way plot wise. And it becomes less about the turtles and more about like, look how crazy we can get. Uh, with all the mutants and and i mm -hmm. think had they had more of a just traditional uh teenage mutant ninja turtles kind of finding their place in this world and had kind of those heroics there uh more in line with the heroics we tend to expect with teenage mutant ninja turtles i think it would have been received much better uh but i think it jumped the shark so much towards the end that a lot of parents were like yeah so i'm sure and parents will talk like mm -hmm. hey i know you want to go see this should we take the kids uh because that gets pricey. Um, mm -hmm. And I think plenty of them are like, man, just just wait for streaming. Like the kids will probably love it, but just wait for streaming. So Yeah, I, I saw. I noticed that the, you know, big, big indicator for me is that the toys are already on clearance. So Ooh. that's uh, that's never a good sign, you know, when yeah, you're no. weeks out from a movie and you're already like slashing prices on the stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, the one thing that I'll say is I, I think it's a shame that it, it's only done as much as it has, because I do think there's a lot of potential in what they established and set up. 
Um, and I think if you if you kind of edited and, and made some corrections for the second film, you'd have a. I mean, they've already announced they're doing a second film. We'll see if they they stick with that. Uh, but if they can learn some lessons from this film, you could have a really good second film. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. Well, um, I, saw, I saw an interview with Seth Rogen where he was talking about you know <laughs> I uh, you know I just uh, I had a bucket. My dad uh, my dad bought toys and uh, you know, traded toys. Now there was a bucket of vintage. Uh, you know, uh, turtles figures, and there are a bunch of mutants. And I was like, my vision, so my vision for this movie was let's just put as many mutants in as possible. And it sounds like you're telling me that's that's part of the problem. Oh, it's 100 percent part of the problem. It, it's it's definitely part of the problem. Well, and they, they you know they swap things around too. I saw like okay, so one of my favorite secondary mutants is Wingnut and Screwloose. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, and they gender swapped Wingnut, and I'm like, uh, and then it was like, and they yeah. gender swapped Scumbug, or maybe they didn't. I don't know, you know. And it's like, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't care. Like, I, I don't, I'm not. I want to see the thing that I like. I understand like you're updating it for a new audience and, and whatnot, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah. When I saw the April designs too, I was like, ah, oh, no, th no thanks. Yeah. I like my yeah. April's. I like my April's ginger and sexy. He had a yellow jumpsuit. <laughs> ginger and sexy. Uh, Chris put, he loved TMNT. Sort of uh, his kid, which was surprising. Yeah. I, I definitely did not dislike it. Um, I, I thought it just, it has that unfortunate uh, circumstance where, the start of the film, I think, is at such a good level and genuinely good level uh, that I was surprised how much I was enjoying it. And then it it fell uh, and it didn't go into terrible, but it's just like, man, like what could have been like instead of rising to the occasion for the end and the climax, you kind of lost your way and, and stumbled. Um, but I, I, I had fun with it. Joe's um, review to me was uh, that he loved the soundtrack, loved the animation, uh, the writing not so much. Soundtrack is great. Com yeah, there's there's definitely some writing that I was like, mm. <laughs> I don't know if I would have written that, but okay. Uh, but yeah, I, soundtrack is a freaking fantastic. Uh, Copa has a great comment here. I don't know exactly. Wait, is Whoopi Goldberg in the in the Mutant Mayhem movie? Because Copa said. No one wants to see Whoopi Goldberg hanging with sewer mutants or they'd watch The View. Is Whoopi Goldberg <laughs> in the movie? Copa, Whoopi's you have the... to clarify. I can't remember. There's so many people in this. Oh, maybe he's referring to April. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, well, actually, Whoopi Goldberg is in the first Michael Bay film. And, like, when I saw that, I was like, ah. <laughs> just, there's no. certain celebrities that, like, if they're involved in something, it just, like, ruins it for me. Like, you know. And Whoopi's one of them. Uh, we do have Drew with Comics Elite in the house, and he said, "Aaron, come on, man, you got to work on your Seth Rogen laugh. Come on, Aaron." I don't know if anyone watches Phase Zero, uh, but Brandon BD from Phase Zero does a freaking hilarious Seth Rogen laugh, and yeah. uh, he'll typically do it when they're cutting to their break, and he'll just like random episodes just do it before they go to break. No, I no never reason. I'd have to listen to it more to really mimic it, but I'm not, oh gonna, man, I'm not, I'm not gonna watch more of Seth Rogen. Oh know, yeah, so no. Uh, I, I have friends that worked with him, and they they did not have fond opinions uh, of working with him. Uh, really? We also have Mark McGrath in the house. Hello, Mark. Um, I one of the reasons I wanted to look at this. I mean, again, like we'll we'll kind of just look at weekend box office. You still have Barbie and, and Oppenheimer, kind of you know, holding on strong Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I think kind of bounced back. I think it had fallen out of the top five and came back into the top five. So that's surprising, but still not doing well. Uh, but I really wanted to look at Blue Beetle just kind of to see uh, 25 million for the weekend uh, domestically. Globally, it pulled in 45.8. This is a hundred million dollar film. So once you factor in marketing, you're probably looking at around 200 million that it has to make back. Um, uh, I just... I think this is going to be another film that doesn't make it. Uh, and it's a film that kept a relatively low budget, all things considered, since we're seeing these 250, 350 uh, production budgets. But still, it just, it's, it's. Uh, Even if they spent only 50 million on marketing, let's, let's say that, it, you know, they, they're, they're all in is 150 million. Let's just say oh, yeah. That. They still have to make 300 million to break even. Yep. And at least. You know, that's the, the on the low end because, you know, on some foreign markets you get less and and, uh, you know, I know that they're not uh, they're not getting more than 50 percent from the theaters. So, you know, they probably have to make 325, 350 to break even. Oh, and yeah. It's it's not going to it's not going to come within a sniff of that. There's just no, no. Not, not with no. these numbers. I mean, at this pace, it's not even going to do what Flash did. And that's sad. 
Um, Cause I, I think there were more reasons to not go see the flash than there were this. Maybe um, in the trailer, maybe in the trailer, they should have had uh, George Lopez say, uh, Michael Keaton's Batman's a fascist. Maybe that would have <laughs> bumped him up in those flash numbers. Yeah, I, I will say that that scene is is very different in the film. Like he says it, but oh, uh, I'm sure. his, his the way his character is, like he's totally all for like yeah. Again, well, he, he's, I, he's obviously an idiot in the film. Like I can even oh, tell that one hundred like the idiot but, uncle. So I was he's never like, offended by him saying that. He he's also like the brilliant idiot uncle that you're like your uncle's crazy, and then he's also the voice of reason when you least expect it, and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> Did your uncle just say this? And they're like, yeah, oh, like like Danny McBride in Hot Rod, one hundred percent, just a Mexican version. So I think that's why I liked him. Like he felt natural, uh, and I he actually had some energy to his scenes. Um, but one of the reasons I kind of wanted to highlight, and we're going to go back to uh, a little off topic, is uh, since this movie's come out and since it's performed so poorly. James Gunn, and, and to a much lesser degree, Peter Safran, because Peter Safran kind of stays in the background and stays quiet. Uh, but James Gunn has been getting reamed on social media uh, for supporting this. And, and it's kind of twofold. Like some people are coming in saying, oh, James Gunn's already ruining it. It's not a, it's not his film. You know, he's, he's had no play into this. He did not write, didn't direct, didn't do anything. Uh, he kind of got stuck with this. And they did that weird bit where it's like, hey, this movie is not part of the this new DC universe. However, this character is, which kind of, uh, you know, tell me you hate me without telling me you hate me. Uh, I'm sure that's what James Gunn was was thinking when Zaslav was pushing that narrative. Um, but people are just giving him crap for this. And I, I want to be like, guys, 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 you're not going to see anything from James Gunn until probably end of 2024, 2025. So everything from then till now is not him. And yes, I understand he's coming out being like, this is great. This is that. But you have to be a company man. Like you have to understand that if you're hired by Warner Brothers to come in and do a job, like I, I think when he took over, when they announced him taking over, there is four films coming out that were DC films that I'm sure he's looking at going, these aren't great, but he's got to be that cheerleader on the sideline being like, Ooh, DC, uh, Warner Brothers, yay! I like my job. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so for me, I just think it's interesting. But uh, I don't know if you've seen all the people kind of going crazy on social media, specifically Twitter. Are we surprised? No, we're not surprised. No, I and I haven't. I haven't seen it. But you know, it's like you know, I mean, James Gunn hasn't done himself any favors by by coming out and saying like the Flash is the best superhero movie I've ever. That was a little bit. That was a little bit much. Like he could have came out and said I liked it. He could have come out and said you know. <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's a, a worthy effort, you know, uh, what what fun. There's all kinds of things he could have said, but he came out and said, oh, it's just the best superhero movie I've ever seen. And that makes me think that he's never seen a superhero movie. He, not even his own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, we'll, we'll give him some credit. We don't know which version he saw. He could have saw one of the other 40 million versions that got filmed over the, like, 10 oh, years that this God, is being so pulled. <laughs> so true. <laughs> And you know what? And by all accounts, this isn't a terrible film. So, like, to be going after James Gunn and, you know, like, oh, this is a disaster. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I, I think he's he's a guy who's in a really hard position. He inherited a tragedy. He got handed this big mess that still had to peter its way out while he was the new voice of DC. So it's a really um, untenable position. Uh, and, and I actually, you know, it's like I would feel bad for him if he wasn't worth millions and millions of dollars, um, you know, but it's still a bad position to be in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I JP Mexican said, damn, I forgot James Gunn looked like that. He yeah, his his uh, transition from the brown hair to the to the full on gray was very sudden. Um, I, I like it. I, I like it, not, too. Yeah. He's not trying to pretend, you know, he's not like schwarzenegger coming out with like the full gray beard but still like just for mending his hair with that weird chestnut brown that's so unnatural you right. know he's not trying to make us think that he's you know with his old ass face like that you know, <laughs> come on like he's he's he went gray it looks good go with it agreed hey i'm all like i'm all for aging gracefully i support it 100 percent. look i'm not, uh, not dying my beard look i'm not dying, oh yeah you know, and James Gunn I, even made fun of that in Peacemaker, being die, being Mister Diebeard. <laughs> oh, for sure. I've I've got some grays coming in down here. It's only a matter of time. Uh, Ivan Sanchez said someone mentioned Lopez was like Doc Brown. Y yes, in some ways. And and the only way I'll say that is, uh, 
George Lopez's character is so paranoid about the government <laughs> that he starts trying to like tinker with all these different things to try to block out like radio signals and stuff. So uh, it works. Like he's an idiot. So even though even idiot. though he's even though he's an idiot crazy character, he's right about one thing. But you can't uh, yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much. So. That's what, like he's an idiot. He, and this is why I love the character because it was so unpredictable. But it's uh, it doesn't feel like it's mishandled. It feels like. If any character was written well, it was this character. He is 100% an idiot. And then he'll say something that is completely idiotic. And then five seconds later, he's saying the most based, accurate thing <laughs> that you're like, dude, you're a moron, but you're awesome. And you're right. So, uh, you um, know, it's, it's, it's talking to Leonard Soldier. He's out of line, but he's right. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's out of line, but he's right. Um, I don't think there's anything else. We got the... Uh, chat uh oh uh oh ken i'm here and ready to follow there you go flaccid you you've picked up some some followers uh aaron i'll have to fill you in on a, a stream uh that we were part of that had an intellect and a scholar and 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 don flaccid phoenix is nothing but sheep so he is now ken the shepherd of the sheeple excellent excellent um yeah let's go ahead and uh move on real quick and just before we kind of get into some of the other topics, I want to go ahead and look at some of the changes because I do think there have been some good changes in the global or the overall year-to-day box office. So domestic, for the most part, your top five have remained the same. Uh, Barbie will, I'm fully expecting it to completely take over Mario by next week. Uh, and it's going to become the number one movie of the year. If you had asked me this at the beginning, the beginning of the year, I would not have ex expected this. Uh, I thought it was going to be more niche. Um, but then Joe and I kind of had a conversation about this and Joe was describing it, you know, if we have any type of brand that is a highly recognizable brand that has not had a feature film in theaters, Barbie is that probably that one brand that hasn't gone to theaters yet. So when he was explaining that perspective, I was like, you know what? You're right. Like, I see where you're coming from. And you're crossing uh, think, many generations too. And and I know, you know, some people are like, oh, the film's woke and, and whatnot. But the majority of normal everyday people that aren't like involved in the culture war that I know that I that have seen Barbie, like yeah. they didn't pick up on any of that. Some of them even think that it's making fun of feminism in a lot of ways, which I think there's certainly a case for that. Uh, you know, so I mean I think that people went in and they got different things out of it, but like what they went in for was just hey, they played with Barbies when they were a kid. They have an emotional attachment to Barbie from their childhood. You know, and that, that crosses multiple generations because Barbie's been a very powerful brand for a long time. So Yep. And and I will say this is a movie that Warner Brothers, like were they were really smart with with their marketing. Uh, I thought the trailers were actually pretty good. The thing that hurt it were the actors talking, which surprised me. You know, they're saying that the actors not being able to do talk shows and give interviews is hurting the films. So I'm like, are you sure? Are yeah, you I don't think sure? it is. <laughs> Do you even care that there's no light, late night shows? Like I, it, it has no. not affected my life at all. At all. It, it, and for the better, because I'm not seeing them on YouTube, you know, being yeah. pushed on YouTube. Yeah, agreed. I don't care if the late night shows ever come back. I don't think they're going to even remotely come back to the level at which they were. I, I think you, we're going to see uh, just, I, I think we're going to see them kind of slowly fade away. You'll have some, but I don't think they're ever going to hold the, I guess the, the lore that they hold before or held mm -hmm. before. Um, but yeah, I mean, Barbie, the, the Warner Brothers marketing team, they created a bit of a, a little phenomenon here um, with this movie and, and you know, kind of giving, uh, having the bar, the life-size Barbie boxes that you could go in and take pictures and then pushing the whole like wearing pink to the movie theaters. Like it, it really kind of created a, a event. Um, and Joe and I were talking about how this is probably the first event that's hit theaters since Endgame. Uh, and I can't disagree with it. Again, I haven't watched the film. I need to watch it. I will be uh, kind of so-so until then. So, um, gotcha. I just saw your comment. Uh, but yeah, so the one surprising thing that I see here is The Sound of Freedom actually popped in the top 10. Super happy with this. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we're, we're getting to see this kind of get some, some uh, good recognition from a uh, box office standpoint. So... It's, really it, like, like, like we discussed, it's, I think it's an important movie. I think it's something that people need to see and, and kind of digest and understand and realize how widespread this problem is. And the fact that the media, like, not only went silent on it, but actively tried to attack it, uh, yeah. you know, it should only make you more suspicious of the media. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
as far as global box office, nothing too crazy here. Uh, Elemental popped in the top 10. Oppenheimer climbed to number four, shifted some movies down. Uh, I'm happy to see Oppenheimer doing so well. Other than that, not a huge change. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to have a, a bit of a short night. But before we wrap up, I do want to kind of touch on two things. One, Suits. Uh, I asked you if you were familiar with Suits. Um, so this show, I think, aired in like 2012. And it popped on to Netflix for the first time in the past month. It is now the most streamed acquired show on any platform. And it's had like 12.8 billion hours worth of streaming. And it just blows for like, why? 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 I don't know. Maybe people wanted something similar to Succession. Uh, maybe people were invested in Meghan Markle. No clue. But it's. Is still- Meghan Markle on this? Yeah. So that's her um, in the solid black in the background. Is behind, is that Gina Torres? Yes, that is Gina Torres. Okay, so I'd, um, I'd be invested for Gina Torres. Same. I love Gina <laughs> Torres. I have not seen the show Suits. If you've seen Suits, let us know if we should watch it. Uh, I think it's like eight or nine seasons. I think it's nine seasons, but they only have eight seasons on Netflix. But uh, yeah, just for whatever reason, this is what everyone has watched. And it's the the like number one streaming show for the summer. And it's killing Netflix ratings. It's killing Nielsen ratings. It's just, it blows my mind. This um, is fascinating because <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh-huh. But I mean, but this kind of illustrates the point, doesn't it? Of, of why the, the writers guild and the actors guild have such an uphill battle against the studios right now is yep. because there is so we're, we've hit a point where there's so much content that if they didn't produce anything for the next few years, that's going to be very bad for the theaters, obviously, but there's plenty to watch. Oh, there's, there's so plenty much. to get caught up on. There's plenty to read. There's, yeah. you know, you could you could spend time with your family. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get crazy <laughs> here, but you know, what? Spend like, time with your family. There's so many things that you could fill your entertainment time with. You could even go. You could go read old comics. Don't read the new ones. Read old comics. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of uh, of things vying for your attention. And the fact that Suits has just become this juggernaut on Netflix just illustrates yeah. that point. Yeah, it's uh, the watch levels. And again, you've got eight full seasons of a show here that people can go watch. So that, that's helping its its runtime and its hours viewed. Uh, but it's like getting up there with pretty much, uh, I think they were saying it's like starting to hit levels that they saw with Wednesday and how well Wednesday did. And uh, um, shoot, why can't it? Uh, oh, what's the 80s kids? The kids in the hall? Oh. <laughs> no, the Netflix show. Things. Yes, I was. Oh God, I almost said Secret Invasion, and then I got so I mad at myself gonna, that I, I thought you were gonna get it. That's I <laughs> it I wasn't coming. Oh man, I'm scared for when I turn 80. I'm not gonna remember anything. You need some uh, Joe Rogan Alpha Brain. Let's take a moment to talk about Alpha Brain, everybody, <laughs> and and Josh and my coffee company. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but yeah, uh, so Suits, if you haven't watched it, possibly go check it out. It looks like it's the show of the summer, uh, despite the fact that it came out more than a decade ago. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Um, Aaron, one final topic real quick. You and I had the pleasure mm-hmm. of being on Comics Aficionados with Mark Millar uh, this past weekend. and uh, Mark, you know, Mark Miller, my friend. As we, oh, as, sorry. As we all found out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He, I, just, he, I'm, likes to, he likes to throw us at that A. He does. He does. And I've gotten in such a habit of saying Millar that's going to take a lot to, to get out of it. Um, but yeah, he, he kind of mentioned, we, we discussed the, the, you know, the lack of quality in comics that's been going on for a while now. And uh, he's coming back. He's going to do a DC or a Superman project for DC. And he pretty much threw down the gauntlet of, you know, like, hey, uh, if we want to see the comics industry do well, if we want to see people come back to comic shops, you know, we have to have good talent at DC and at Marvel and DC and Marvel need to do well. So indies can do well. Uh, Cause you got to get people, you got to footsteps into the shop so people can, can see, um, you, you know, these indie books that are there so they can at least be aware and take advantage of them. And, you know, I would say that for, for Marvel or for DC, you've got him coming in for Marvel. You get uh, JMS kind of coming back to do that, that, Captain America, which I think are potentially two two sellers there, um, but he M- Miller made the comment like I need to make some phone calls to some friends and get like five people to go do some stuff at DC and five people to go do some stuff at Marvel, and, and see if that can drive sales. I guess I wanted to ask you, 
who would you like to see? And I think we understand, like, you, you've got to have – these people are going to have to have freedom to do what they want to do. Like, editorial and higher-ups, they cannot get involved. They're already ruining comics as it is. But who do you think could come in and potentially make an impact with some of these books? There's a lot of people that I think could come in and make a huge impact on uh, on these books. But there are people, unfortunately, who uh, have wrong think, and therefore, you know, the companies would never bring them in. I think that, uh, you know, you need to go back to group editors on these things. And if I was put in charge of DC tomorrow, uh, I would make Chuck Dixon the Batman group editor. Absolutely. I would just, I would put him there. And and oh, and, and anybody in the company who has a problem with that, well, you don't have to work with him. You know, there's the door. Uh, Fair. Because we are pivoting towards profit. And I don't care if you don't like him. If he can make us money, you know, and he'll have his time to prove that he can, whether or not he can. You know, that's that's what we're interested in. So I would love to see Chuck back on some things, you know, writing as well as uh, overseeing some of these new writers, you know, just a mentorship that he could give to, you know, to writers that are up and coming would be fantastic. Um, I think on the stream we mentioned that, like, Mark writing a Spider-Man story drawn by Todd McFarlane would be incredible. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that could happen because I, I think Todd does think that he can write. Um, so, you know, he might want to do his own thing and not draw what someone else is telling him to do, but man, <laughs> it, what a dream project it could be. Uh, yeah, I just like to see Todd come back and draw some Spider-Man. I'd love to see the original team of him and David Michelini come back. You know, yeah. there's all of these, these guys that wrote these great, you know, great comics that, uh, that I absolutely loved that could come back and could do this stuff, you know, and, and obviously a lot of guys have passed on that I would have liked to have seen still working in comics. Like, you know, Mark Gruenwald, uh, we just lost Dan Green, who was, you know, famously the anchor for Mark Silvestri's X-Men run. I'd yep. like to see Claremont and Silvestri come back and do some more X-Men. Um, I'd like to see, you know, uh, God, I'd like to see anybody of talent on X-Men at this point. Oh uh, God. Yeah. You know, well, that office is such a mess. I think, you know, even, yeah, we're going to move Brevoort over there, but who's going to, who's going to write the book? Who can you even get? Who wants to inherit that? You know, uh, all of that mess. Um, you know, you'd have to have somebody crazy like me. And, and even then I'd, I'd be coming in going like, I, I don't want to hear any of your guys bullshit. Like I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to fix it. Just get yeah. out of my way. You know, yeah. that would be the, the sort of thing. It would be like, you guys are not telling me what to do. The fans are telling me what to do. You know, if they like it. That's then I'll keep going that way. If they don't like it, I'll switch gears, you know, but we're going to find something that, uh, that satisfies the fans. So I don't know that I, I really had to have, have enough time to like, kind of think of like the dream teams that I'd like to put together. But, you know, there's so many guys in the industry that are still doing great work. They're just not doing it at Marvel and DC. The fact that nobody calls Walt Simonson to do anything. Yeah. The guy can still draw. The guy can still write. Yep. You know, his, his wife's right. Still writing, you know, like they could come back and they could do some things you can have, uh, you know, who else do we have out there? You've got you got Dan Jurgens. Yep. Dan Jurgens just like what is what is DC giving him? He should be in charge of things. Peter J. Tomasi, guys that you know like or at least you know maybe not to the level of, of Mark Miller in, in that level of fame or or success, but guys that are just really solid and have told great stories over the years and have contributed so much. And the industry just kind of tossed them to the wayside, you know, for all this identity politics hiring so that we can read stuff like uh, like Hot Girl 2, which we read on Max's stream, which made me want to eat a bullet. You know, it's just <laughs> like, uh, you know, and maybe that's why DC is doing it. They're like, we need Aaron to eat a bullet because it'll stop talking. Just keep putting out Hot Girl issues. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, I just, you know, I, there's so many people still in the industry that uh, that could come back and could make a difference. And it's the same with animation. I, I've always said that, too. It's like. You know, you've got, you know, Greg Weissman still working, but, you know, for the longest time, guys like Tad Stones, you know, they weren't, they weren't getting offered shows or anything like that because it's always yeah. give it, give it to these younger people. Well, yep. these younger people haven't, you know, they haven't been mentored properly. They haven't cut their teeth. They haven't gone through the grind. They haven't learned. And therefore, you know, that the stuff that we're getting is not as good. Agreed. Agreed. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of in the mindset that uh, I, I'm right there with you. And, you know, we see like Chris Claremont, Chris Claremont, Peter David, they're, they're getting booked, but they're getting these like, offshoot minis you know that that in the grand scheme of things don't don't matter because they're not continuity or they're old continuity just to fill in gaps um but it's these are people that can write long form stories like they know how to handle characters and and build arcs that are both uh, uh short arcs and and uh, you know longer arcs uh they know how to write teams they know how to write heroes Yep. Uh, so the fact that you're not giving them a chance on something that is ongoing just blows my mind. Uh, the fact that there's this idea that certain artists are old school and, and you know, can't cut it. They're doing better and are better than so much of what we're getting now. Uh, you mentioned Pete Tomasi and, and, you know, he's not the biggest seller 
uh, especially up front. So, like, I think his Superman run that he did with uh, Gleason is, is one of the best. Uh, there's not a single story in there that's like, oh, my God, this is the best story. Just that run, all those issues, he tells such a good story. And and his his issues have become a really big seller not in the issues themselves, but in the collections and the omnibus that they're now re-releasing that omnibus. And I think they have plans to re-release the Super Sons omnibus of the those stories that he wrote because they're selling so well in that format. And that's that evergreen that DC's had so much uh, success with, you know, the, the Batman year ones, the Swamp Things that like once you get it collected, they sit on the shelves and, and they'll stay there. Um, but I know we mentioned uh, Spider-Man. I would love to see him take on a character like Spider-Man uh, just because I know we're going to get a long form heartfelt story. That's going to be a good run. Uh, mm-hmm. If you want to do a short with Millar and, and uh, M- Miller and uh, um, God, who, why can't I think my mind Mc, tonight? Mc, McFarlane. Yes. Mm-hmm. Miller McFarlane. Like I think that would sell gangbusters. Um, I think there are certain artists you could bring back. I think there are certain writers you should bring back despite their uh, social issues that quote unquote mm-hmm. are out there. Um, <clears throat> Warren Ellis. Uh, but yeah. Oh God, the industry, the industry needs Warren Ellis so badly right now. So, like, so badly. And, it's and, so and, bad. You know, and I'm still not entirely, I don't want to get into all of it, but I'm still not entirely clear on what it was that, uh, Warren Ellis did aside from when groupies came around, he like indulged them. Yeah, pretty but, much. You know, like I, I, which I don't, uh, I, I don't see how, if you're throwing yourself at a guy, like, you know, especially a guy who's, uh, you know, let's face it, like a comic book nerd. I mean, he's going to, he's going to respond. And it, you know, from what I've seen, it seems like he'd be like, you know, Hey, are you interested in, in me personally? And if they said no, he was like, okay, good day. And moved on. Like, you know, it wasn't, uh, so I don't know, like, but that guy's talent is, uh, you know, is undeniable. Uh, he's written some of the, you know, the very best stories in comics. Uh, his Thunderbolts run was absolutely fantastic. Trans Metropolitan is a great, great story. Yep. I've loved stuff that he did, like Black Summer was good. Uh, you know, um, even, uh, even the stuff that he did over at, uh, um, who's the, uh, the company that owns Bleeding Cool? Uh, Avatar. Oh, you know, yes. The stuff that he would do over there whenever, uh, whenever he needed a check. You know, um, a quick check, you know, he could do something at Avatar. But even all that stuff was really, really good. Um, God, you know, and there's so many, like, Bill Willingham could be doing, you know, some really great stuff. You know, I don't know why these people aren't, aren't getting hired, why they're, you know, it's probably, probably has to do with money. It's the fact that they don't want to pay them. Yep. But, I was going to uh, say they're too they, expensive. Yeah. But, um, you know, you got to spend money to make money. You got to spend money. Uh, and, and hey, you know, maybe it's smart to stop wasting money on books that aren't, you know, recouping their costs. Just throwing that out there. Maybe um, you need to stop hiring people who've never written a comic book and giving them a new number one. Maybe you need to go back to the old, you know, the old standard of you looked for people who'd written a few things and you said, okay, we're going to give you a backup. We're going to give you this one shot, you know, and see what you can do. And then, you know, if they deliver, then, you know, they slowly start to move up the ladder. Maybe you need to go back to that. Maybe you need to go back to accepting pitches instead of, ha- instead of uh, having editors call people up and going, so I got this idea. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the gold goblin. You want to write it, oh. you know, and, and having people go, dear God, no, I don't want to write that, you know, yep. um, and, and then you have to go through several writers until you find somebody who will, you know, editorial needs to not necessarily be steering the ship when it comes to this is the story we're going to do now find somebody to execute it. You know, you need to have people coming in who have good ideas that you can then help shape. That's the job of an editor. It's not my job necessarily to dictate an entire plot to somebody and then have them write it. It's, it's my job to take their plot, help them hammer it out you know, get rid of the things that it doesn't need, you know, strengthen the things that are, you know, its strengths and then put it out in the market so that people can enjoy it. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to highlight Omega Man, uh, put Robert Menditti 100% yes, was, agreed. Mm-hmm. He's one of, one of the, the best. That I meant to mention. Yep. Uh, he's one of the best out there uh, and, and doesn't get the recognition he deserves on the scale that he deserves, but he writes damn good stories. And I think, you know, get a, even though he's not as high profile, if you get a, a good enough artist that's high profile, it'll kind of elevate that book. Uh, and it's going to deliver great artists to Tom King who tells stories yes. that aren't worth reading. And yes. give those, give those artists to Robert Vendetti and see what he can do with them. Like yeah. give him a clay man, give him a Jason Fabok, give yep. him, you know, and, and let him do a book. And then maybe he's the guy who starts guiding your events and yep. actually does some, some events that are really good. And maybe you can get people hyped for these characters and these stories again. But like right now, the way you're going, nobody cares. Nobody, nobody cares crap about night terrors. 
nobody uh you know, <laughs> no. it's like everybody's laughing at it basically yeah every, every chat well, that i see is like boy this issue was terrible we took the people that were considered mid or you know mid to low and we made the, we tried to make them the superstars of the industry and it's just not working uh i'll add jeff lemire into this get him on a book give him a good artist um and you know you mentioned jason fabok Jason Fabok and Jeff Johns, one of the best selling books in the recent years was Three Jokers. It sold like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. And they have gone back to DC since then with an idea for a follow up, and DC will not get back to them. And and it's like, whose fault is that? <laughs> whose fault is that? Is that, that Jim is, is Jim Lee too busy on the right? You know, like, well, there's no red carpet now. He should have plenty of time. I know that he was like spending a lot of time going to movies and taking pictures I... on the red carpet and posting on his Instagram. But like now none of that's happening. So maybe, you know, you could be more involved with, uh, you know, getting back to Jeff Johns, letting him do something. The fact that Jeff Johns is not writing at DC is mind boggling. I mean, he's there. He's, he just finished up a mini star goal mini. He's got uh, JSA, which may or may not be a mini. It's kind of been back and forth in what it is. But, I mean, they're not utilizing him like they should, and, and it's definitely a, a disservice. So You've even got guys like Greg Weissman out there who've written comic books, and every yep. time DC gives him something, they don't promote it, they don't put anything behind it, you know, and and same thing with the work that he did at Marvel, but, you know, he can obviously write a series. He's written yeah. several great animated series. You know, he's writing Gargoyles right now at Dynamite, you know, yeah. where I should be writing Darkwing Duck, but I'm not. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's like he's doing uh, he's doing great stuff there you could bring him in and put him in charge of a couple books. You know, I'm sure if he's got time in his schedule, he'd love to do it. He loves comics. Yep. There's, I... there's all kinds of talent out there, but you know, unfortunately the comics industry has become, you know, so just so filled with nepotism to its detriment that, uh, you know, people just want to hire their friends. They want to hire people that are, you know, their, uh, their allies and whatever, uh, you know, political uh, screed that they're, they're pushing this week. Yep. And uh, it's, and the customers have gone away. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, we'll we'll kind of end this conversation after we finish the stream. If you guys will go in the comments, let me know who you would like to see writing for Marvel or DC. What books would you like to see them on, uh, writer and artist? And uh, let me know if you think they would uh, help kind of boost the industry because we all know the industry needs it. Uh, and maybe, maybe someone from Marvel or DC will see this and be like, hey, that's not a bad idea. Uh, we can cross our fingers, we can pray, and we can hope. Also, apparently, Mark Miller is going to make some phone calls <laughs> to some people. So, please. Uh, we even know some guys in our own circle that could do some great work. Oh, like, uh, I, I've said repeatedly, Joe Corallo has given yep. me a one, like told me a, a pitch that he'd like to do for Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. and I would like if I was in charge of DC, I would greenlight that immediately because I think it's a pitch that would elevate Green Lantern, uh, it would elevate Wonder Woman to the level of you know of being in the Trinity. Because Agreed. Superman and Batman are like the big two. She's the third part of the Trinity, but she's always like down here as far as like your talent and your stories go. Absolutely. Because uh, you, you can't think of too many stories where, you know, it's like, oh, this is a great story. Uh, you've got the uh, the run that she had in the late 70s, early 80s, I think, or mid 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you got that run, but that's that's pretty much it. You know, there hasn't been much Lopes did, Bill Lobes did some good stuff. I like yeah. John Burns' run. Um I liked uh, I liked La Presti's art on his run with Gail Simone, even though I didn't like the run itself, the story itself. Yep. But Agreed. I liked his art. Um, you know, so there's uh, yeah, there's so many talent, so much talent that they've chased away or that has been blacklisted for yeah. for petty petty stupid reasons. Petty. And, uh, yeah. Everybody in the industry should be green listed. If you make money, if you bring in money, you can work for us. I don't care what the hell your uh, you know your viewpoints are. Uh, agreed. I, I I hope at some point, you know, these these uh, psychos running these companies will get desperate enough that they uh, that they do that. Um, all right, folks, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up uh, before we do, because uh, wrapping it up is smart. It, it makes sure it helps you make sure you don't have illegitimate children. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we do, <laughs> Zach, I want to see Josh writing the authority. I do not think I'm qualified to write the authority. And I am perfectly fine saying that because I feel like I'd tarnish such a good thing. Uh, but there's other stuff that I would write that I think I could do a damn good job on. Uh, but uh, Aaron, where can we find you if we want to find you? Where do you hang out? What are your haunts? And uh, do you have a lot of uh, bearded friends with really cool beards since you were hanging uh, out at Doc? Seems like the older I get, the more everybody has beards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, you can find me on Twitter, just uh, at Aaron Sparrow. Uh, it might be at under Aaron underscore Sparrow, but, uh, you know, pretty easy to find, uh, you know, I'm on Instagram, uh, I'm on Facebook, but I never check it cause I hate Facebook. Uh, so don't, uh, don't try to message me there, but, uh, yeah, either of those other places you can get me, you can find me here. 
You can find me on Thinking Critical with Wes. Uh, occasionally, I pop into Clownfish TV, talk to Neon about things. Uh, gosh, like what else? I think that uh, I think Jesse and I might be launching a show this week uh, that's all about toy collecting. So yeah. uh, you know, we, uh, we I'll, uh, I'll announce more of that on my Twitter if uh, if you guys want to check that out. But uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's where you can find me. Yeah, or avoid uh, me, as the case may be. I, I meant to tell you, I don't know if Joe told you, but we had like this whole like 30 minute section randomly talking about toys when we had our stream. And we were both like, where is Aaron when we need him? <laughs> uh, and yeah, Joe was like, I'm, I'm discussing out. this because Aaron's not here. Uh, <laughs> so he's being Joe. Uh, I do have Aaron's information below uh, concerning his Twitter. And uh, I also have the stream that we did with Wes on, on Thinking Critical for Comics Aficionados with Mark Miller. If you guys want to check it out, it was a really good stream. He joined us for about an hour and we got some really good fun conversations. And also, if you've never read his books, especially his, his more recent stuff has been, he's just knocking it out of the park. Um, so you should check out his comics. Uh, as for me, you can find me at, at Joshua L. McDonald on Twitter or at Bipopped. Uh, of course, I'm here every Tuesday. Uh, we are, are we are finalizing the Bat Group for Batman Year One and the launch of graphic content. And I've already started partnering with my manga team. Uh, we're going to kick off with a manga show as well. Uh, those will be monthly, so get ready. And uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff coming. And happy to see you guys here. Happy to have you in the comments. And we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, have guys. a good night. <laughs>